What's up, y'all? How we doing? Hey, can we just give it up one more time for Brad and Jay? Guys, it is, it is an honor to be a part of a community where God gets to use our gifts, right, to portray his truth, his goodness, and his grace towards us. Um, and I would recommend, if you didn't get to, I'm not sure if it's online, I should have asked Zach before I said this, um, but uh, if you didn't, Daniela Russell did an amazing dance last week as well. Um, and it's just so cool that we get to see the Lord's giftings uh, in use to him. Now, before we jump into today's sermon, uh, I want to uh, be super clear about something. Uh, during today's message, uh, there will be a part of it that I, I would say is not super kid-friendly. We're going to uh, really dive into some topics that are deep uh, that I don't think uh, kids should be in here for. So if you do have children here, I would encourage you uh, to either uh, leave or I will let you know right before we're going to jump in to that um, so that you have the opportunity to go. Now... Um, Usually, uh, if I'm speaking, you guys get to hear some pretty, pretty embarrassing stories about my life. Uh, but today, I don't want to start with an embarrassing story. I actually want to welcome you in to something that I have been processing for over 27 years, going on 28. All of my life, I have struggled with feeling like I belong somewhere. Now, in particular, I'm talking about within my ethnic identity, for those of you who don't know, I'm Puerto Rican, um, and that has uh, been a part of my life, obviously, since I was born. My parents are Puerto Rican. Uh, my dad and my stepmom were, like, overly and actively involved with different Latino groups on campus, or on campus, um, uh, like, around the state. Um, they would meet with these, like, high-up people, um, and they would just talk about, like, where the future was for Latinos in the state. And like there was just something in me uh, that was always a part of those that I never really felt like I should be a part of those meetings. Honestly, there is a part of me that always felt like I was never really a part of my family. You see, although I grew up Puerto Rican, uh, when I was in the third grade, I got the opportunity to move to Brookfield, Connecticut. While I was in Brookfield, I met uh, a bunch of people, but a majority of them were white. Now, uh, I was not necessarily part of that community. There were still some differences, some questions that were asked about my life or my family's culture that made me feel like I, I didn't quite fit in. Fast forward, in sixth grade, I move to Bridgeport, but I go to school in Fairfield. I went to a small private school there, and uh, again, it was a pretty white environment. It was, there were a lot of white people around, and there was still something that always felt like I was a little bit off. Fast forward, I go to high school, and I go to Fairfield Prep, um, and again, still felt that. And in two areas of my life, I felt like I had a foot in both worlds, but never was fully understood. See, while I was experiencing feeling not enough with my friends, I was still too white for my family. Um, I didn't speak Spanish. I still don't speak Spanish super well. I can't dance, I'm pretty stiff, you never wanna see me dance. Cue, relax. The, hip, the hips are getting a little bit better, you know? They're starting to move. Um, I, I can remember going to visit family out in Puerto Rico and uh, I would just sit and look like an idiot as my family would talk back and forth and I was just like, I had no clue what they were saying. There was part of me that just felt so disconnected. But there was part of me that felt like there was this constant longing for my culture. You see, I remember sitting in uh, weddings or at family get-togethers and watching my grandparents dance together and just thinking, man, that's so beautiful. I love the way that they sway and move together to the beat of our people. Although I felt like an idiot listening to my family talk to each other, there was something about the way that they laughed that just made me feel like, man, I want to understand because I want to belong. All of my life, there was this thread that I felt like was pulling me in closer, but I was never close enough to fully be there. Many of us may not be able to identify with what that looks like culturally, 
but I would say that your heart and your soul do. You see, we were created to be image bearers. We were created with the intention to bear the image of God to this world. It's unique that during this worship set for some of you who don't believe or don't fully believe, there was a pulling on your heart. You wanted to be a part of something, but you didn't know what. There was a common vernacular in language that you said, I feel like I'm connected to this, but something just isn't enough, and it's me. And friends, I would love to tell you that it's just the secular culture outside just the secular culture that has told us that that's actually where we belong. That's where we fit in. But like Russ talked about last week, I believe it is our insecurity and our sin that hold us away from fully stepping in to the culture that we were actually created for and to take part of. This whole sermon series, The 808 Gospel, was to talk about the underlying base to every song like Jay and Brad talked about, like the beat in the video that you can feel the stage shaking. It's the very thing that runs through our lives as a connection point to who, were we, who we were created to be. Friends, you and I were created to be an image bearer. You and I were created to walk with God. But like Russ talked about last week and like we're gonna talk about today, Sin changed that forever. With that, I'm gonna pray and I wanna jump into our scripture for tonight. Holy Spirit, we thank you so much that you are present and here with us. King Jesus, you are the only one worthy of our praise. Lord, I pray that you would anoint every word that leaves my mouth. God, I pray that you take every great idea I have and put it in the back seat. I only want your ideas. I only want what you're speaking right now. Friends, before we move on from this prayer, I actually wanna ask you to pray something. Something simple. I'm actually gonna ask that you would say it out loud. All you have to do is repeat after me. Jesus, speak. And so in your name we pray, amen. We're gonna be reading from Romans 5, 6 through 21 today. Romans 5, 6 says, for while we were help, still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people because all sinned. In fact, sin was, the, sin was in the world before the law, but sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgressions. He is a type of the coming one. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if by the one man's trespass the many died, how much more have the grace of God and the gift which comes through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflowed to the many. And the gift is not like the one man's sins because from one sin came the judgment resulting in condemnation. But from many trespasses came the gift resulting in justification. If by the one man's trespasses death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one trespass there is condemnation for everyone, so also through one righteous act there is justification leading to life for everyone. 
For just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so also through the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The law came along to multiply the trespass, but where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Last week, Ross talked to us about uh, different types of sins, and uh, I wanna see how well you guys were listening to him. Um, can you raise your hand if you remember at least one of the three sins, or three types of sins Ross mentioned? Yes, sir, in the back. Keta, yes. Russ did a whole karate chop, good. Yes, Jonathan. Pesha, good. Awesome, last one. Yes, Avon, Avon, perfect. Awesome, you guys did a great job. Russ was, Russ was a little worried. He said, ooh, a little Bible quiz. Um, I'm not gonna talk about each sin, right, or each type of sin, but what's important for us to know is that uh, these different sins separate us from each other and separate us from God. Right, as we read through this passage of scripture, it is evident, evident that the weight of sin is death. The way in which we have committed transgressions or actions against God has impacted our entire relationship, not only with each other, but with the holy God who has created us. You see, as we sin, we find ourselves further and further away from the life that we were actually designed to live with him. You see, there is a longing in our souls to have a full and transparent vulnerability in relationship with God. Adam and Eve in the garden walked without shame, naked in front of each other and naked before God, not just physically, but God could see through all of who they were and they knew him. But then, through Adam's sin, our relationship and the intention, right, is forever changed. Through one man's sin, our lives and the earth are forever changed. Chaos ensues. And we are forever separated from a closeness to God in the way that he had once intended. But as Russ explained last week, and it's important for us to understand, is that even in that moment, even in the moment when chaos ensues and all hell breaks loose in the earth, God had a plan. He knew from the beginning that there would be one to come who would stomp and break the serpent's head. There was one to come who would forgive sins forever. But what does that mean for us? And how does that impact us today? Guys, as we read through this passage, it's very easy to see that, man, there is something innately wrong with us. Although created to be image bearers, what we read in the language of Paul is that we are ungodly. We are enemies with God. We are sinners. Or in the definition that Russ gave last week of sin, we are the ones who miss the mark often. And when we look at the Old Testament and we read through the punishment for which our sins deserve, because I am so grateful that Jesus came and died for us. You see, the punishment for sin in the Old Testament before there was a sacrificial system put in place was often death. Guys, if you disobeyed your parents, death, I would have been gone a long time ago. Premarital sex, death. Worshiping other gods, death. The weight of our sin is death. Thankfully, soon after, there's a sacrificial system that God puts in place where once a year the high priest would go and he would sacrifice on behalf of the people asking God to forgive their sins and each person or family would come and they would bring animal sacrifices so that they could be sacrificed. But you tell me if you've ever read through the book of Leviticus, if you could remember all of the different animals you were supposed to bring for the different sins you had at that point, I'd just be bringing the whole farm. The weight of sin is death. No longer were we being put to death. No longer were we being sacrificed, but the animals were being sacrificed on our behalf in order for us to have some sort of a right relationship with God. 
But God, but God had a better plan for us. Scripture tells us in verse six that while we were still hopeless or helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. He tells us, right, that, hey, most people would not die for a bad person. Most people wouldn't even die for a good person. But how much more, how much more have we been justified in the fact that God, perfect and blameless in all of his ways, would die for us? You see, it was our helpless state in God's understanding that regardless of what we do, we could never fully win salvation for ourselves, that he was drawn to the cross. Because I wanna be real with you, no amount of cleaning, no amount of sacrifices, no, no amount of proving to God that you are worth being saved will actually save you. It is not your good deeds. It is not how great you are, how much you come to church. It's not how much you give. It is solely based off of the fact that he loved you so much that he would die for you. So he endures the hardship and pain of a brutal death just so that we could be united in him. And guys, we, we can't take this death lightly. We maybe really only talk about it once a year, Good Friday services, and we walk away feeling good about ourselves, but then our lives don't change a week later. We don't fully understand the torture that Jesus endured on our behalf. You see, leading up to the cross, Roman soldiers who were experts at torture and death would strip Jesus of all of his clothes they would have likely chained him to either a stone or a wood pillar, and they would beat him again and again. They would beat him with this thing called a Roman flagrum, a whip that would have anywhere between three to 12 strands of leather on it. There were metal balls that were uh, woven into the leather, and at the end of each strand were pieces of broken pottery, glass nails, bone, or some sort of twisted material that had the intention and the design to literally rip the skin and muscle off of someone as they were beaten and whipped. As I want us to imagine in that moment, Jesus, blameless, never sinned, never did anything wrong, perfect, but for us, he gets whipped and again and again and again and again. Because it's said that by the time the soldiers would have been done with Jesus' body, his back and his legs would have been uh, bloody. They would have literally just been like ribbons of flesh hanging off of him. What's interesting is that this beating was nicknamed the half death. Why? Because half of the men who received it died from it. But not Jesus. No, Jesus had more to endure. Friends, now is the time where if you have young children, I would ask you to take them out of the room. When I was a freshman in college, I went on a retreat and the speaker was trying, trying to drive home a point. Friends, what Jesus endured was because of us. It was because of our sin. It was because of the sin of people who had gone before us. We don't truly know the weight of it, even in word. I'm gonna ask you guys to turn your heads to the screen.
Jesus would endure that. Because he would take that beating for us, for our sins, for the things that we've done wrong. And like I said, he wasn't done. That was a 30 second clip of which in the passion of Christ is about a 10 to 15 minute clip of which in reality probably would have gone on much longer. The end of the clip literally shows Jesus on the ground bloodied from his head down his body and he would then take up a cross that weighs about 60 to, 7, 60 to 100 pounds and he would take it up on his back and he would walk to the cross. You can imagine with each step, splinters diving into his body. Because it was my sin that did that. It was your sin that did that. He would carry the cross to the place where he was meant to die and they would nail him through his bone to the cross, one hand by one hand. And then through his feet, they would nail. And they put him up on the cross and with every breath that he couldn't take, he would lean up with all the strength that he had just to breathe for a moment only to fall back down. Desperate to breathe. Because he did that for us. No more death. No more sacrificial system. No more bringing animals. Why? Because he was treated like an animal for our sins. Murdered on our behalf for our sins. In the whole walk there, scripture says, for the joy set before him, he endures the cross. For the joy that doesn't look joyous. But you know what was joyous to him? Was being united in a relationship with you. Was having you to himself for all of eternity. That's what he counted as joy. And every step he took meant one step closer to us being with him in eternity forever. No more sin, no more death, no more grave. Why? Because of his goodness and his sacrifice. Because of his love for us. And man, Paul, Paul talks about it as, as this gift. Paul says in verse 15, he says, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if by the one man's trespass, the many died, how much more have the grace of God and the gift which come through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflowed to the many. And the gift is not like the one man's sins, because from one man came judgment, resulting in condemnation. But from many trespasses came the gift, resulting in justification. If by the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of the righteous reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ, he finishes by saying, so then, as through one trespass, there is condemnation for everyone. So also, through one righteous act, there is justification leading to life for everyone. For just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so also through the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. The law came along to multiply the trespasses, but where sin multiplied, what multiplied more? Grace. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Guys, although sin had reigned on the earth and separation from God was in abundance. 
Christ came on behalf of us to defeat those things. The one sin of Adam that plagues mankind has now been forever turned on its head by the one man who has never sinned, who died the death that Adam deserved so that we may live an eternal life with him. As Russ and I were talking earlier this week, we were talking about sin and hell. And so often hell is depicted as this like fire and brimstone and like you don't wanna be hot for the rest of your life. So, so give your life to Jesus. But if, cell is eter- if hell is eternal damnation and separation from God, I think it might feel like fire. But really, I believe it feels like a depth of loneliness that we never were meant to understand. Darkness that was never meant for us. A world absent of hope. Why? Because God's spirit isn't there. His relationship with us isn't there. That is the ultimate place where our sin has separated us fully from him. But guys, it's through him that we have been offered eternal life. It's through him that we've been offered new life. As you and I were offered a free gift, nothing we have to pay for, nothing we have to do. Literally offered a free gift to say, here, I want to be with you forever. Here, I want you into eternity. For those of you in this room who feel like there is no one who could ever love you, there is a man who died on a cross for you because he wanted to be with you forever. Every unlovable quality about yourself, he loves. Everything that you find worthless in yourself, man, that's the very thing that drew him to you. And what does he offer us? Life. And he, he offers us life to the full. Now, that doesn't mean that we're never gonna have bad times. It doesn't mean that we won't experience hardship or pain, right? We still live in the in-between of the now and the not yet of the kingdom of God, fully coming to earth. But what it does mean is, man, we can walk with a different swagger. We can walk like, man, ain't nothing stopping me, baby. Why? Because the God of angel armies is by my side. Because his goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Man, scripture says that he will prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And man, I, I've, I've wrestled with that because I'm like, well, Lord, what, who, what people gonna be at that table? And he's reminded me, Andres, it's not people. Man, it's your loneliness. Man, it, it's, it's sexual sin. Man, it's It's lying. It's the demons that pursue you because they want your life because they know you're worthy of something. And they will sit and they will watch you dine. They will watch you have a good time. Friends, this is the eternal life that Jesus is offering you. Is that you would sit in his presence. You would rejoice in his presence. You would be made whole in his presence that all the places in your life where you feel not enough, he would say, come and let me be your enough. For the rest of eternity, we will spend time getting to know him. And man, as we spend time getting to know him, we will know more of ourselves. We will understand fully who he created us to be and how he intended us to be. Worshiping at his side. Worshiping with the angels, and that's eternity. Is this fullness and this wholeness of relationship with God? But we have to accept it. We have to trust and fully believe that Christ has come to die for us, that there is nothing we could do to actually wash ourselves clean, to save ourselves. We must believe the fact that Jesus came in, that that God came in human form through Jesus, lived a perfect life, 
died a death that was not meant for him, for the forgiveness of our sins, and that he resurrects again in bodily form. This isn't a spirit. It is the son of man who has come to die for us and now lives so that we can live with him forever. So what do we do with that? As I believe that we go to the table and we sit with him and we have a real one-to-one conversation with the Lord. For some of you in this room, I believe that you are still wrestling with do I fully surrender my life to Jesus or not? There are some of you in this room, I believe, who have never truly heard this message before that like I said earlier, your heart has been pulling at you to be part of the culture of heaven. And he's just asking, will you come? And there are others of us in this room who have heard this message before on a Good Friday and on Easter Sunday, but we forgot. Because I wanna invite you to commune with God, to talk to him about your sin and his sacrifice for you. And typically we say like, hey, we're gonna give you a couple minutes and we come up after 30 seconds. I actually wanna leave time. I'm gonna ask that you guys would get up and separate from your friends. This isn't a a together thing. This is a you and Jesus thing. I believe that he wants to speak to you. He wants to invite you into conversation with him. And I'll come up after that. John 15 reads, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Later, he says this. Where is it? There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends, and if you do what I command, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my commandment, love each other. As you can keep your head down, your eyes closed. If you're in this room and you're like, man, I want to give my life to Jesus. Like I want tonight to be the night where I am made whole and new. With every eye closed in this place, I just want you to stretch your hand up fast and you can put it down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Come on. Man, if that's you, I just want you to pray quietly, but pray out loud. Say, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. Thank you that you have walked me into eternal life. I surrender my life to you. And I will live for you all the days of my life. Amen. For those of you who are in this room, who needed to be reminded of his death and his resurrection, would you just raise your hand quickly and put it down? I want you to repeat after me as well. Jesus, thank you for your death and resurrection that changed everything. Thank you that your love covers a multitude of sins. Thank you that you've pursued me, that you've watched over me. 
you. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, here's what's awesome, right? And I know that it's a super somber moment, but I'm gonna be real with y'all. I'm excited. Yes. Jesus' love for us gave us new life. He has literally brought us out of the depths of our grave so that we could encounter him and we could live forever with him. And there is story after story of people in this room who have encountered him, who have been made new by him. And they are walking testimonies of the goodness and the grace of God. His death is sad, but his resurrection, man, it is life-giving and it is life-changing and it is life-altering. So I wanna encourage you, man, in the place where maybe shame lives, know that Jesus covers over that. He loves you deeply and it is worth rejoicing Why? Because there are people in this room who gave their lives to the Lord. And scripture says that, yes, yes, we're gonna clap in a second. (laughs) Scripture says that if one person gives their life to the Lord, man, heaven is having a party. So I want us to join in and have a party with the Lord right now. And we're gonna hoop and holler for like 20 seconds. Ready? One, two, three, go. Come on. Michelle, I'll teach you what that means. <laughs> Guys, Jesus is so good. I'm so grateful for his love. I pray that this week you would have encounters with him that would make his love more known to you. I'm gonna invite Russ and Bree back up to end our service for today. <laughs>